Well, I'm really glad to be with you guys today. Um, we're continuing in our book by Jerry Bridges, the, the Beautiful Life, or the Fruitful Life, excuse me. And we're talking about this idea of the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit that the Holy Spirit gives us? The overflow in our lives. So I want to read out of Galatians chapter 5, starting verse 16. And if you'll read with me, if you have your Bibles, turn there. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I've always liked this passage of scripture because it talks about the contrast of those who are living uh, in the spirit of God and those who are living based on their own desires. And it begins by giving us a list of all these uh, different immoral behaviors that obviously we don't as Christians uh, involve ourselves with. But then it goes on and says, this is what the fruit of the Spirit is. That word fruit uh, is very similar to the word that we would consider fruit today. It's the, it's the overflow. It's the abundance. Uh, when we look at it in the Greek, it has a lot to do with the, the uh, end of our labor, the things that we see as our labor comes, our toil comes to an end. And here, here it says, this is kind of the overflow. This is the crop, the produce that you produce. And, and, and then it begins with the word love. Uh, love is interesting here. And a lot of commentaries have made this argument that maybe this word love kind of encompasses all the next few words. And it talks about gentleness and self-control and, and, and the different... Uh, the different qualities of, of the Holy Spirit's work in our life, that maybe love is kind of the, the container. When you think about fruit, fruit means container of seeds, literally means container of seeds. And this word fruit is a singular word. And so you can think maybe love is the container here and all these other words kind of fit within them. And so uh, definitely... Love at the beginning of this phrase, at the beginning of this list, is important because it says this is kind of the launching point. This is where it all begins. It starts with the idea of love. I remember as a kid growing up, uh, we would sometimes give devotional talks, give talks with our youth group. And occasionally as we do so, we would, we would choose topics. And I remember thinking to myself, what topic am I going to am I going to choose? What would I like to, to select? And I, I remember thinking to myself, I don't want to choose love, because love is uh, is a weak subject. It's this kind of cotton candy, cotton ball, uh, rainbows, and you know, unicorn kind of subject. It's really easy. Nobody wants to wants to deal with something so fluffy. But as I've kind of gotten older, I've realized that love is probably one of the more complex themes of the Bible. The way we see love sometimes is not true to the true message of love found in Scripture. So today, as we think about the fruit of the Spirit of love, the overflow of God in our lives, the overflow of God's Word in our lives, what does it mean that the, we would begin to produce this, this concept of love? And, and what does that look like? Well, when you think about the word love in Scripture, I'm sure there's a number of words that come to mind or maybe phrases that come to mind. One of those phrases for me is the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment. Uh, another phrase that comes to mind is the most excellent way. The most excellent way. 
And even if you think about the golden rule, really the golden rule is kind of wrapped up in the concept of love. So we have the greatest commandment, the most excellent way, uh, the golden rule. We could even say these three things remain. All other things will pass away, but these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So we, we come to this question, why is love such a big deal in the Bible? We want to look at a couple of different things here in Scripture, but the first one we want to look at is the reason why love. The reason why love is such a big deal in Scripture. I'm reminded of a passage of Scripture. It says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God has made us manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. When I read that passage of scripture, this thought comes to mind is, what is love all about? And the answer is, love is about God. God is love. It's not God is loving or God loves people. Those would be qualities and characteristics. But the idea that God actually is love. When you think about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, says that love is patient, is kind, and isn't easily angered and it keeps no records of wrongs. You hear that, maybe you've heard that at a wedding or different times in your life that you've heard that phrase. The concept comes up that those are qualities that we want to have in our lives, things that we want to do. We want to be patient. We want to be kind. We don't want to be easily angered. But God doesn't do those things. God is those things. As God defines love in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, this is who I am. I am patient. I am kind. I'm not easily angered. I keep no record of wrong. God is one who does the things of love because he is love. Uh, it's who he is in his character, in his nature. And so as we read and think through scripture, the, con- the concept comes up over and over again is that to love is to be like God. The reason we love is not because God's even commanded us to do so is because we want to be like him. That's who he is in his very nature. So God's nature is love. God is love. But he's not just love. He also demonstrated great love for us. If you think about the text again, it says, in this love God made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son. It reminds me of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. When you think about the picture of love, the greatest illustration of love, we see the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who came to this earth out of love, self-sacrifice, who lived a life of love, serving and caring and teaching and modeling love, demonstrating love in everything that he did, self-sacrificially, up until the cross when Jesus, in love, gave us the ultimate example of what love does. He was willing to die for our sins. That's what love is. Love is self-sacrifice. Love is a willingness to put others first. And so as we look at Jesus, we see the model of love. God is love. That's who he is. That's his nature and his character. And then God demonstrated love. And the greatest illustration of that is in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ's willingness to die on the cross for us. Well, love isn't just a concept. It's also something that we are called to do. Not only is it modeled to us by Jesus and shown to us by the character of God, but it's something that we're called to do. And scripture says over and over again that we are to love as he loved us. I want you to listen with me in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 35. It says this, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second's like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus says, hey, you want to understand the whole law and the prophets that comes back to these two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It was interesting to me as I read through Jerry's book here, A Fruitful Life, the message that he raises or the, the question that he raises is how can a person love someone with everything and then turn around and love someone else too? Scripture says love Jesus, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And it's a kind of an interesting concept because Jesus in the same book, in the book of Matthew, will say these words to say, you can't serve two masters. You'll be devoted to one and you'll despise the other. You'll love one and you'll hate the other. You can't love both God and money, says in the Sermon on the Mount. So here we have Jesus in one chapter saying, you can't love two things. You have to choose. And then he comes in this passage and he says, I want you to love God with all that you've got and also love your neighbor as yourself. So here's the question. How can you give 100% of yourself to something or to someone, the case of God, and at the same time have love for anything else? And the answer is this, that the love of God, a love for God, compels us to love others. It's not that we are splitting or dividing our love up. When we have 100% love for God, the overflow of that love is love for others. And we can't do that with love for others. If we just, if we love people and we try to divide our time between people and God, people are going to win. You can't serve two masters. If you love things and you try to love things with God, it won't work. Those things will win. You can't serve two masters. But when it comes to loving God, you can love God with everything you have. And the outcome of that is that love will reflect in your relationship with other people. It's a crazy concept. And that's what I believe Jesus is teaching here in Matthew chapter 22. Our love for God will be so profound, so great, that it'll cause us to have love for others as well. It's interesting when you look at the passage in Matthew chapter 22, 35 through 40, Jesus says a couple of things here. The first thing he says is, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind, and strength. It's fascinating to me that our love for God is to be our own individual love. We're to give him all that we have, not all that somebody else has. It'd be easy for me to think, you know, I, I couldn't possibly have uh, the same level of strength maybe that, that somebody who's, who's been around longer has. Um, but even to say to have the same level of heart. Sometimes we judge each other's hearts and we say, you know, I don't have as much heart as that person has and I should have more heart or I should have, I should have you know, a, a better mind. Well, Jesus says, love, every, love the Lord, your God, with all of what you've got. Love him with what you've got. And then the second commandment, once we love God with everything we've got, the overflow of that is that we're going to love our neighbor as ourself. That phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, assumes that the next object of love, after we give all of our love to God, the very next thing we'll do is we'll love ourselves. Because as we grow in our knowledge of God, as we learn to love him and appreciate him for what he's done for us and how he sees us, we begin in turn to start liking ourselves, to start loving ourselves, to start seeing the world as God sees it, which means an acceptance of self. And as we love ourselves in a Christian and godly way, in a humble, not proud, but truly Christian way of self-love, in turn, we begin to see other people and start to see their value, their inherent value. And so we love God with all that we have. And as we love him with all we have, the overflow is we begin to love ourselves and we begin to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Very fascinating concept to me that the love of God would compel us to do that. Now, this theme is seen throughout Scripture, this theme that says to love God is to love others because it's the overflow that's going to come. 
I think about these passages in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Well, we talked about this one. No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. And so once again, we see this idea that you have to make a decision. But when we love God, we're going to naturally overflow with love. Listen to this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. But love it, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. He says, if you love God, you know what you're going to do? You're going to love others. That's 1 John 4, 7. He repeats that concept in verse 11, 1 John 4, 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He says it again in verse 12. No one's ever seen God, and if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. In other words, if we love God, what are we going to do? We're going to naturally love others. And finally, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 21, And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Why is that? Because the love of God, to love God, is to overflow love for others. The more we get to know him, the closer we grow to him, the more we're going to love others. Maybe this is an easy way to put it. We really think about the nature of God, who God is, his character, and what he was willing to do for us, his willingness to come and to be born in that nativity scene that we picture sometimes and to live a humble life, to die for us on the cross. It should compel us to have a perspective of God that we just can't shake. We can't get rid of it. Think about God and his willingness to love me in spite of all my weakness, in spite of all my sin. What does that cause me to do? How does that cause me to behave? As I look at him and I fall in love with him, all of a sudden I begin to see myself in a new light and I see the world in a new light. Maybe I could word it this way. If I really loved or really believed John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that verse itself would just compel me to, to realize that the world has a problem, that I have a problem. So we need a savior. And because we need a savior, we had a God who's willing to come and live on this earth, sacrifice for us. And our response, humanity's response to that was to kill him, the death of Jesus. But God's great love for us, his great care for us and compassion for us resulted in us being saved, being saved treated as children, even though we're unworthy, even though we don't deserve it, that God and his great love would see us as special and, and care enough for us that he would die for us on the cross, that he would redeem us with his precious blood. Well, what does that do to a person, a person who believes that, a person who has faith in that message, who hopes in that message? It should compel them, firstly, to love themselves, and secondly, to love others to see others in the same light that they're in. And so here this message of God's love overflows in our lives to where we're just showing that to other people and showing it to ourselves. The closer we come to God and the more we have faith in him, the more we're going to have a healthy outlook on life. And so we see this message over and over again, the message that says, hey, if you love me, the result of that is you're going to love other people. Love me with all you've got. And it's going to overflow in your life towards yourself and towards others. Well, there's something else about love that I think is really important, and it's this. That that love that overflows is in alignment with the love of Jesus. As we turn to, to other people, we begin to show them what love looks like. That version of love that we show them is not a selfish love but it's a self-sacrificial love. I want you to hear this passage again in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. He says, you want to know what love looks like? He laid down his life for you. And if you're all in, if I'm all in, and I love him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, then my response to other people is going to be self-sacrificial. He laid down his life for us. And so we're going to lay down our lives for others. Verse 17, let's continue on. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, 
yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? So he starts off and he says, God's love for us was self-sacrificial and our love for others is going to be self-sacrificial. And here's an example of what that looks like. If you see your brother in need, don't close your heart to your brother. Have the same level of sacrifice, the same level of care. So Christianity, Christ's love for us, compels us to live self-sacrificially. I think that's one of the challenges of love. Because once again, when I was growing up as a kid, I always saw this as such a fluffy, touchy-feely subject. I kind of get caught up in the message of the Beatles that all you need is love and love is all you need and kind of kumbaya, we can all sing with Coca-Colas in our hand and sway back and forth. But here's God saying, you want to know what love looks like? Love is sweat and blood. Love is the pain and the nails and the cross. It's the crown of thorns. Love is the, is the robe that was placed on his back and the whip that was put on his shoulders or placed on his shoulders. It's the pain that Jesus endured for us. You want to know what love is? Love is not, it's not unicorns and it's not cotton candy and, and rainbows. What is love? Love is when you look at someone else and you treat them better than yourself. So how do we become those kind of people? I mean, that's a supernatural kind of love. That's not as simple as like. It's more complicated than that. And it's more complex than, than anything the world can comprehend or understand. And that's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. Because as we look at what the Holy Spirit produces in people, it's supernatural. Christian love is supernatural. It is not of this world. It is otherworldly. It's the kind of love that you can't see when you turn on TV or you listen to a song on the radio. It's a totally different kind of love. And Jesus would model that in the way he treated us. When he came to, to live and to die for us. But it's really summarized well in Luke chapter 7. Excuse me, Luke chapter 6. Because in Luke chapter 6, Jesus will say it this way. He says, but I say to you, this is verse 27, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the one cheek, offer him the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do for you, do also for them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that for you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that for you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is it to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to, to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your heavenly Father is merciful. I love that passage of scripture because it says Christian love is not of this world. I think it's really easy for us to get wrapped up in concepts that are of this world. Concepts that say that it's good for life to be fair. It's good for people to get their way. It's good for people to have what they want and to be able to make something of themselves. And some of these concepts are not necessarily wrong. But here's the thing. They may not be Christian. Christianity calls us to something even greater. It says that we treat other people better than ourselves. It says we pray for our enemies and love those who persecute us. And I'll tell you, I've been there. I've been in situations where I've seen my enemy and my prayers for my enemy have not been humble, godly, caring, loving prayers. 
But here Jesus says, if you really want to be like me, if you want to really want to be like Christ, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Lend to people who won't return favor. People who can't pay you back. Maybe James would say it this way, is that pure religion is to take care of widows and orphans in their time of need. To give to people who can't give back to you. To care about people who don't have the ability to care for you. To love the hurting and the, the poor and the weak. And Christianity is a higher standard. Once again, this is the fruit of the Spirit. As we think about the fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about things that just do not come natural. I think all of us struggle with this concept. All of us struggle to, to love outside of ourselves. I remember saying to, to my family a, a while back as I was getting a little older, it's, it's occurred to me how much of life is not about me. And it's such a strange concept because it does seem like we should be the center of our own stories, that we should be who life is all about. But Jesus came in and he showed us by his character, the character of God, that that's simply not the way Christians behave. That Christianity is about placing others first. Christianity is about self-sacrifice. Christianity is about loving God more than anything else. And when we love God with everything we have, we will see overflow out of our life Love for ourselves and love for our neighbor as ourselves. So I want to compel you and challenge you this week as you think about what it is to be a Christian. How are we any different than the rest of the world? Are we like the Gentiles and the sinners, the pagans, who just love those who love us, who just lend to those who are going to pay us back, who just turn the other cheek for the people in our lives that benefit us? Or are we going to be like Christians? Christians who are like Christ, who because of our great love for him, sacrifice in everything we do, place him first. It's not easy. It's not easy. But that's the very reason we want to talk about this subject, because love is not easy. It's not fluffy, it's not weak, and it's not light. It's hardcore and it's real. I want to encourage you this week to think about the love of God and the love we're to have for each other. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for those who may be watching today. And I want to ask God that you would be with us as we think about what it is to be a Christian who loves others greater than ourselves. Father, we desire to love as you love. Father, we desire to, to know you and to care so much about you and to believe so much in you and what you did for us that it's just natural and easy for us to love others. But Father, there's this great challenge before us as we struggle to be people of faith, and to be people of love. And so Father, we just ask that you would just continue to work on our hearts and give us spirits that Father would place others first, but number one, that would place you first, Father. We trust you and we love you. We pray this in your son's name, amen.